Good afternoon. On today's Angry Bulletin, we've all seen this spectacular footage by now. All of this amazing video that we got from SpaceX's astonishingly good Starlink cameras and their ground cameras as well of Super Heavy successfully setting down in spectacular fashion well enough to justify a catch attempt next time. However, there were a couple of details that SpaceX has been leaving out of their most recent recaps of the fourth flight of Starship. Footage that not only suggests that Starship may have had an engine explosion and a subsequent fire at the time of the splashdown, but actually that the rocket may have exploded shortly after this supposed soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico. And if this is indeed the case. Is a catch attempt the best idea right now? And in other SpaceX-related news, the fearless Jared Isaacman is about to do it again. At the end of July, the Polaris Dawn mission will be kicking off, and this time it will be far more dangerous than the first mission involving Jared Isaacman. Fortunately, it will be SpaceX employees involved in this mission and not random contest winners, but nevertheless, this is going to be, without a doubt, the the most dangerous private spaceflight mission that's ever been undertaken for a wide variety of reasons. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Bulletin. I am going to be venturing into very dangerous territory, the territory that involves speculation based on rather shaky evidence. However, after spending a lot of time looking over this series of photographs and an analysis of these photographs by a social influencer who calls himself the Space Engineer on Twitter, or X as it is called now, I have become very suspicious, in fact, a bit convinced actually, that Starship Super Heavy on the fourth flight of this amazing rocket actually exploded shortly after the video footage cut away that SpaceX was providing to us. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this particular image was not faked and was taken from the same perspective by the same video camera and SpaceX simply has not been releasing this information to us. But of course, this possibility creates quite a number of questions. First of all, why would SpaceX SpaceX hide this explosion from anybody. SpaceX in the past has been notorious for putting their various failures on display to the world to show people how they develop rockets. Even though they call these accidents how not to land a booster, they never seem to be very hesitant to show these events as part of the overall process of making a close to flawless rocket, at least as far as Falcon 9 is concerned. And if SpaceX is indeed hiding this event from the public, they certainly couldn't hide it from the FAA. And how could the FAA possibly greenlight another flight without an investigation if the Super Heavy booster had exploded at the moment that it landed? That certainly can't be part of the flight plan, right? Right? Well, it's not exactly that simple. First of all, let's have a look at the photograph to see if this is just something that was photoshopped or engineered. According to the space engineer, and by the way, I tend to trust this guy's judgment because he's both a photographer and a digital artist. There's quite a number of things about this image that suggest that it is indeed genuine. First of all, people have criticized the size of the explosion and the fact that we're looking at 
a mushroom cloud, something that's usually associated with a nuclear blast. Well, according to a post-flight 2 FAA document, this is actually about the same sized explosion and the type of explosion that one would expect if a landing super heavy were to explode, because a landing super heavy should still have at least 20 metric tons worth of propellant and oxidizer left in its tanks at the moment of ignition, which would definitely be enough to produce an explosion of this size, between 210 and 260 meters in diameter, assuming that it's roughly hemispherical. Once again, since it's not an airburst explosion, the size of the blast, including the mushroom cloud, closely resembles what the FAA postulated would happen with a super heavy explosion on the ground during a landing process. And there's a lot more besides. We also need to talk about the colors of this particular blast and how the colors and the light diffuses through the signal light of this buoy. Now, this might be harder to spot if you don't have an understanding of how light distributes through materials. By the way, I'm quoting directly from the space engineer here because I don't understand how light distributes through materials either, but it looks correct. It matches the rest of the image and people tend not to notice it and so it doesn't get called out if this image was fake. Again, it's not impossible to fake the type of light distribution that we see in this image, but it would be very challenging to blend it correctly. And if one were to fake this, going to extreme lengths like this would just be absolute dedication just to fool a bunch of people. Just to make some notes as to what we're looking at here, it's slightly orange, diffused in the center and absent from the edges. Also, the blending between the explosion and the buoy is virtually perfect, very hard to replicate. The signal light casing is probably made of one quarter inch or one eighth inch plastic thick. So to produce such lighting, this is roughly what one would expect. So this photo is beginning to look super accurate. And by the way, the space engineer goes through a lot more detail about the clouds, about the color comparisons between this explosion and the explosions that we know a great deal about from SN9 to SN10, SN11, etc. We got to see quite a few Methalox blasts on the ground previously. And given that this was created by substantially more more propellant than those explosions would have been caused by. I tend to agree with the space engineer's assessment that there's a 99.99% certainty that this photo is indeed real and that Super Heavy did indeed explode either on impact or shortly after impacting the water. But again, the question remains, first of all, why would SpaceX want to cover this up? Why wouldn't they want to put this on display like every other rocket explosion we've seen with SpaceX in the past? Well, in my opinion, it's because of the catch situation. SpaceX doesn't want to create a scenario where a pad RUD during a catch attempt looks any more likely than it already has to. We already know that it's very likely that Super Heavy is not going to be able to be successfully caught on the first go around. But nevertheless, I don't think SpaceX wants to advertise to everybody in Boca Chica exactly what this pad RUD is likely to look like once they make this catch attempt, especially given the fact that Super Heavy can't even make a successful soft landing in the water right now without blowing up. And why would the FAA want to play along? Well, it all depends on what the actual flight plan for the fourth flight of Starship really was. If it included the strong possibility of an RUD during the soft water landing, then actually Starship did not deviate from its flight plan at all. The FAA could care less if you blow your own equipment up or indeed even if you kill your own employees during a testing process. Their primary focus is to protect the public. And just to be clear, a pad RUD is almost certainly not going to present any threat to anybody in South Padre Island or any civilians anyplace else. But the main thing that concerns me right now is if SpaceX 
is still not at a place to where they can safely land Super Heavy without blowing it up, even on the water, then why do a catch attempt so close to their very important and very critical launch facilities? It seems a bit premature to try to do that at this stage, although I understand that Elon is trying to move forward towards reusability as rapidly as possible, this actually is not the version of Starship that we're going to see carrying astronauts to the moon eventually. We're going to need Raptor 3s on Super Heavy in order to carry at least 100 tons, probably more, up to low Earth orbit because this current design using Raptor 2s isn't going to be able to get the necessary payload up to orbit anyway. And also, keep in mind, a pad RUD is almost certainly going to damage the launch facility and significantly delay the sixth flight attempt of Starship. And right when we're getting to the point where launch cadences are starting to get less than two months or so between flights, and we could get even better than that as long as there's no FAA investigations involved, any pad RUD that results in damage to the launch facility is definitely going to count as a mishap in the FAA's book. It's going to require an investigation. It's also going to require repairs to the facility, and it's going to slow down launch cadence, not speed it up. And most importantly, if Super Heavy had exploded in all of its glory in front of the cameras, in front of millions of viewers, it would have been a lot more difficult to claim complete success on this flight, as SpaceX was very quick to do after things seemed to go so well during the fourth flight. And I want to be completely clear about one thing. Overall, the fourth flight did very, very well. Overall, it was a spectacular jump forward for this program, but an exploding super heavy definitely puts a big asterisk on the end of what we would call a test success with this particular flight, and it also suggests that it may take a little bit more time before Super Heavy is actually going to be reusable. You have to be able to land the thing safely before you can reuse it, and if you can't even set it down on the water, it might be a lot tougher to try to catch it in midair. By the way, as soon as I finish making this video, I'm going to send an official inquiry or request for comment to the FAA asking them whether or not this photo is genuine. Not sure if I'll get an answer, but if I do on Monday, I'll definitely let you guys know. So let's move on to SpaceX's other exciting project right now, and I would urge you not to cut away at this point just because it's not about Starship, because this is a very, very big deal on lots of levels. Polaris Dawn is going to do things that no private space mission has ever attempted to do. Indeed, no astronaut has attempted to do something like this since 1972. First of all, Jared Isaacman seems obsessed with traveling as far away from Earth as he can possibly get in a Crew Dragon, and frankly, I can't really blame him. The first highly elliptical orbit that Polaris Dawn will take, and by the way, in case you're curious, Polaris Dawn is just a private mission with a Crew Dragon and a Falcon 9, for those of you who don't know this, but that first orbit is going to take them about 700 kilometers above the Earth, which is the highest altitude crewed flight since the Apollo moon missions. And by the way, the ISS orbits at roughly 400 kilometers, so a lot further. As a matter of fact, this will take Isaacman and the rest of his crew out into the Van Allen belt, at least briefly, where they will be bombarded with a significant amount of radiation, and that will be the topic of some of their tests to determine exactly how much radiation future astronauts are going to be exposed to when they pass through the Van Allen belt. By the way, the primary mission, the primary objective behind all of this is to try to raise more money for the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This is a personal crusade on Isaac Smith's part. It's a wonderful objective that he's trying to do, raise as much money for this charity as possible. But this isn't the only thing they're going to do. It's not not just a huge and extreme orbital trajectory, it is also testing SpaceX's new space 
space suits because the suits that they've used on Crew Dragon prior to this have just been vacuum suits for emergency decompression situations, not for taking spacewalks. So this is a huge leap forward in SpaceX's life support technology and their capability of actually exploring destinations throughout the solar system. Unfortunately, this spacesuit is not advanced enough to have a life support pack. Instead, it's going to be connected to life support by a hose like the old school spacewalkers like Alexei Leonov and the Gemini astronauts. And herein lies the danger. Crew Dragon, like the Gemini spacecraft, does not have an airlock. Instead, it simply has a hatch, as you can see. This means that the entire spacecraft is going to be exposed to the vacuum of space, meaning that all four astronauts on board are going to have to wear these suits, not just Jared Isaacman. That's one potential problem. Now, another issue is the fact that if something happens with this hatch, if for some reason it sticks while it's open or malfunctions, has a mechanical problem, something like that, it's going to be a race against time for these astronauts to fix the problem before their life support runs out, because obviously you can't land while the hatch is open like this. And on top of all of this, historically, conducting spacewalks like this has proven to be very problematic in the past. Alexei Leana found his suit expanding because of the pressure differential between the suit and, of course, the vacuum outside, and found that he couldn't actually fit himself back inside his spacecraft. And there have been problems similar to that all through the history of spacewalks, with the most difficult and life-threatening spacewalks taking place while the astronauts were trying to conduct this sort of operation using exactly this type of technology. In other words, not an independent life support pack, but rather being 100% dependent on the life support inside the spacecraft and a single tether separating you from oblivion. If the crew finds it difficult to bring Jared Isaacman back inside the spacecraft because of problems with the tether, problems with the spacesuit, or whatever other unforeseen issues may crop up in the future, well, they're going to be left with the unenviable decision of either leaving Isaacman outside to die or risking death themselves as they keep trying to struggle to get him back inside before their life support runs out. This is a very, very dangerous operation, something that would challenge even experienced professional astronauts. Fortunately, these people are not complete greenhorns when it comes to this sort of thing, but then again, only one of them has ever gone to space. The crew, by the way, is comprised of retired United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Scott Kid Potet, and he's the pilot, and also mission specialists Sarah Gillis and Anya Menyon, and I probably mispronounced those names, I apologize, but they're both SpaceX operations engineers, and of course, Jared Isaacman himself as the mission commander. So certainly all of them have at least some experience with space-related technology and all of them have gone through an extensive SpaceX astronaut training program, but still only one of them has any real experience and even he is a bit of an amateur when it comes to all of this. So this is undoubtedly going to be a very exciting and frankly nail-biting operation. We'll see how well things go. and You can bet I'm going to be covering it in great detail. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I will be thanking more folks who made my journey to Shetland possible, by the way, and I'll be including some more details on everything that's happening up here in my next live stream tomorrow. So until then, stay angry about space.